Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Dr. Kaplan. He's actually a fellow family doctor and cannabis physician, which I haven't had too many on the show before. So welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Yeah, it's a privilege to be here. And sadly, there aren't too many of us. So we are a, a valuable in limited numbers. I think so. I think so. So, um, you know, just before I kind of get into answering uh, or sorry, asking you some questions, can you just give the audience a little bit of a brief background about yourself? Sure. I am a board certified family physician. Um, went to school in uh, the Boston area, trained at some of the uh, most prestigious schools and hospitals uh, here in the Boston area and realized that I hadn't been taught a huge piece of medicine. And I said, wow, that's not okay. Um, so I did what I was taught to do, which is learn, look outside the box and see what's missing and try to piece it together. Um, and I did that. I, I assumed a role overseeing a lot of patients so I could learn from real people and real experiences. And I did a lot of book learning and read the research that's out there. Um, despite what people seem to think, uh, there is a ton of research about cannabis, you know, as you know, better than most, Mike. Um, and I did what I thought was right. I, I did the practice of medicine according to what the evidence is showing and what's working for patients. Um, and here we are now in a culture that's realized that they made a big mistake with cannabis. You know, we're hearing it from everybody, from all corners, all walks of life, all types of people. And certainly now from the government too, uh, the HHS, the Health and Human Services system, um, has recommended to the DEA that this should be rescheduled, that there is real medical value. And we are as a culture creeping into modern age with cannabis. Yeah. So, I mean, I obviously am a big supporter of cannabis and believe that it can, you know, help uh, so many different people for so many different conditions. But when did you officially start prescribing cannabis? What year was it? Um, I think 2013 is when I assumed the chief medical officer role of a company at the time that was called Canicare Docs, um, here in Massachusetts. It was a company, um, that was largely lost, um, you know, kind of throwing cards at people as if that was medicine. Um, and I jumped in as a role thinking I could, uh, educate the doctors, change the system, try to learn more from patients in a structured way. Um, and I realized that, you know, it's really hard to change the old system. Um, but I'm here to try and, you know, like you, I'm, I'm trying to teach people. My, my platform is really about sharing knowledge to try to empower listeners. And so when you did start treating patients, you know, around 2013, what were they coming in for? Like, what's the main thing that you found you had the most, uh, effective, um, treatments with, with regard to this canvas? The top three that people come in with statistically are difficulty sleeping, stress and anxiety, and then pain. Um, of course, we all think that cannabis treatments are all about, you know, seizures and end of life care and cancer care. And those are certainly important players, um, but they're not the most common. You know, cannabis is a medicine for all people in all walks, depending on what they're going through. And most people are suffering with those ailments. Um, and as time has gone on, you know, I, I, I've looked carefully at what people are suffering with and what treatments they're using cannabis to find relief for. Um, you know, and hopefully we'll get to chat about this new book that I published, dumping all of this stuff that I've learned into the public's hands. The doctor approved cannabis handbook um, is my foray into publication. It's being distributed now internationally. And it's really not an effort for money. It's an effort for teaching people what I've learned so that they can use these tools to help themselves. Amazing. So um, within the book itself, like with regards to say, let's just kind of go through some of the top conditions that you mentioned. For example, you know, you mentioned insomnia, then you start to talk about stress and anxiety, and you start talking about pain. So maybe we'll just kind of go through some of those things and uh, what's in the book around those. So um, I know I mentioned pain last, but I'm just going to start with that one, just because there was a study that came out uh, maybe about two or three weeks ago as a uh, cohort, I think of about 12 to 15 studies, I had published it or not published it, sorry, I had posted it online certainly didn't uh, publish it. Um, but in uh, that study, it said that, um, you know, I'm going to get the numbers fudged a little bit, but for CBD only, people report it 40% uh, of more response to pain control. And then they had a, uh, another group of people who were taking CBD and THC, and that was a little bit over 60%. And, you know, some people, when they see these numbers, they think that, oh, that's, you know, too high. But when I look at it and I see that, like, 
those are, you know, very typical numbers that I see from patients that I see in, in my office, meaning that when I do prescribe CBD to patients, lots of patients do tell me that they have 40% or more of relief of the pain. And when I prescribe a combination of CBD and THC, yes, lots of patients, again, you know, tell me that, you know, they have a 60% reduction overall in pain when, when they're using those medicines. But, you know, maybe you can uh, explain to people, uh, Dr. Dr. Kaplan, how people should be using CBD and THC to treat their pain and maybe how um, each cannabinoid um, may be different for different types of pain. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, you know, the the traditional medical model is you have pain and they, they show you a, a list of faces and say, which face are you with your pain? And it's such a silly organization of pain because it never really applies to anybody. Um, you know, I might be in pain with my shoulder, but you know what? I'm kind of bummed about it. And you know what? I can't lift the groceries I wanted to and I'm, I'm feeling sad. Um, so pain is never a one-sided thing. And similarly, the medicines shouldn't be a one-sided treatment. You know, in traditional medicine, we have a, a sort of scale. We start with things that are, you know, low relief and low addiction potential, and it moves all the way up to opiates, which, you know, block the ability to feel pain um, as if that's the only sort of dial. There's only a volume up. Um, and that's ridiculous. You know, we have cannabis now as a treatment for pain. And, you know, like you, I've seen more success more happy patients finding relief with cannabis than any other medicine I've ever seen, including opiates. Um, and part of that is because it's working better overall, but it's also not single-minded. It's not just fixing the pain. It's helping people feel a little bit happier. I mean, you know, even that's a shocking thing to people. Like, what? It's okay to feel happy. You know, we live in this weird culture where, you know, even the medicines shouldn't taste good. They shouldn't feel good. Um, you know, to buckle down to your question, you know, cannabinoids work in very specific ways, both locally, so at the shoulder, at the back, or wherever it's hurting, but they also have another layer, which is they're multi-system actors. They're working where it hurts, but they're also helping your muscles relax. They're also helping you feel a little bit of levity. You know, you're not going to take your problems to heart. They don't become the center focus of your whole existence. Um, so they allow a little bit of breathing room for people. And, and ibuprofen is not going to do that. Tylenol is not going to do that. It just works in a totally different way. Um, and I think people who have been through the system have tried talking to their primary, talking to specialists. They're not getting that kind of multi-system action. And boy, are they excited when they see something that works for them in an open-minded, full-spectrum way. I agree. And I think that, you know, it's important... Um piece about there about, you know, treating the mind itself. So, you know, a lot of patients who start taking CBD, for example, their primary reason for taking it is to treat pain. But, you know, they say, you know, sometimes when they come up and follow up that, you know what, uh, I actually like this better for my anxiety or my stress, even better than my pain control. So, you know, you can't essentially, you know, kill two birds with one stone. And, you know, people sometimes do, you know, come in in clusters, meaning, you know, they may have a little bit of obesity, a little bit of depression, you know, a little bit of pain, you know, all these kind of things. And then, you know, you give them some cannabis again, not saying it's going to, you know, be magic, but it can help someone reduce their pain when they have the pain reduction, then they can start exercising a little bit more. They may feel a little bit better about themselves. Maybe they socialize a little bit more. So, you know, it doesn't just necessarily treat the pain. It can essentially you know, treat the whole patient. Um, and then just coming back to, you know, the pain control for a sec. Yeah, the CBD can be highly effective for pain control for from an anti-inflammatory uh, point of view. And then the THC, from my understanding, essentially, you know, through the dissociative effect, um, you may ha still have the pain. It's just that it's not bothering you as much in your brain because you have this slightly dissociated effect with the THC. You know, obviously, some people want to don't want to be too dissociated. We understand that. You know, that's just kind of part of one of the you know side effects of THC. But if you use it in low doses and especially in conjunction with CBD, oftentimes you can get a little bit of that dissociative effect without feeling impaired at all or feeling impaired very very minimally. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, we speak the same language. I think most people think cannabis is all about being high. And, you know, I, I take issue with that simply because there's nothing wrong with feeling levity, feeling a little bit of extra joy, you know, even if it's artificial. I think, you know, we don't mind going to the movies and zoning out. But as soon as 
something that you eat, like a gummy, does that, all of a sudden there's you know negative attribution to that. You know, I, I don't think that's silly, but there is opportunity, as you say, with products that are not altering. Um, you know, right now the pain model is you know the next choice beyond uh, ibuprofen is sometimes GABA pentin. And GABA is the molecule, the neurotransmitter that helps us feel calm and relax, relaxed. And, and guess what? THC does the same thing. It increases the neurotransmitter gabapentin in your in your brain. Sorry, GABA in your in your brain. Um, so these medicines, the, the cannabis is not working in a different way than traditional medicines. It's not like we don't understand what's happening. It's not magical. It's just so much more than that. Um, cannabis also works in the same kinds of ways as ibuprofen does. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like a multi pill. I often make the analogy for people. If you could take all of the pills behind the pharmacy counter and put them in a blender, you know, that's a multi system, lots of medicines in that, that, that jar. Um, cannabis is very similar. There's so much in there. Um, that's beyond just one particular medicine. So of course, it's going to work for a lot of different things and a lot of different people because it's working in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And, and I don't want to harp too much on the, you know, pain, uh, too much longer, but just before we do move on, there's probably people who are, you know, asking or thinking about what about cannabis pain cream. So can you just maybe, you know, give us 30 to 60 seconds on, on how, uh, you know, those pain creams can be helpful. Maybe what you've seen in your practice as well and, and in the book. For sure. Yeah, no, there's, there's a whole chapter um, on DIY cannabis, you know, and, and topicals is, is one way that people can not only not only feel relief, but make their own relief. You know, the industry is trying to make a lot of money and sometimes the products are too expensive for people and they're worried about that. Um, you know, cannabis is one of these things because it's a plant, people can grow it themselves if they know what to do. Um, topical relief is shocking for a lot of people. You know, we have kind of Arnica and Bengay. We have lidocaine that sort of numb up or, or quote unquote affect pain, but not really. Um, cannabis topicals are dramatic. I have patients, you know, I did a documentary about a patient who's a musician with arthritis and he couldn't play anymore. He sort of lost his career. And with topicals only, he got his career back. He was able to play. He's not feeling daily pain. He has better movement in his fingers. It's dramatic. Um, and that's not an uncommon position. People use these creams. I have a couple of professional athletes that use them for bumps and bruises on the ball field. I have little old ladies that use them for rickety old bones. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a growing field, uh, so to speak. Um, because some stores don't know what they're doing. You know, they, they put a lot of THC in or they put a lot of CBD in, but they don't mix it with anything else. It ends up not working as well. So there's some science that belongs um, applied to these topicals. Um, but if people are interested, you know, they can find a cream out there. There are plenty that do work. Um, and, you know, of course, there's no alteration. And you, have, and you have plenty of this on your in your book as well, correct? Yeah, there's a whole chapter on topicals. There's a whole chapter on pain. Um, and DIY stuff, where to buy it from the industry and non THC stuff too. I really tried to put everything that I wasn't seeing out there in one concise guidebook. Amazing. Okay. Let's, let's move on from, from pain then. Um, why don't we talk about insomnia? Cause a lot of people are struggling with insomnia these days. So, um, why don't we first talk about people who don't use cannabis and then they want to, you know, come in and see you. I'm sure you have a book or sorry, a chapter on, on sleep in, uh, in your book as well. Um, so say if someone's naive to cannabis or having trouble sleeping, what would be your overall approach? And if you can kind of get into specific ratios and maybe even dosages of cannabinoid ratios. Sure. Yeah, no, I think everybody comes from a different starting place. Um, and, you know, if, if cannabis were only to help people sleep, that would probably be enough. Um, we heal when we're sleeping. Um, and these days, people are so stressed out. They're in so much pain. All the other stuff that's going on during the daytime, if people can have a vacation, if they can just recuperate when they're sleeping, you know, even that would be enough. Um, and people seem to be comfortable taking Benadryl or taking melatonin or taking chamomile tea. You know, there's something about people who are new to cannabis that, you know, there's an element of fear about trying cannabis. Um, and, you know, we have to understand that that fear is intentionally driven. You know, we had a culture from the 1930s that made people afraid of cannabis. Um, despite all the evidence that said it was safe, you know, people in politics and power had um, campaigns to make sure people were scared of cannabis. Um, so the regimens people find helpful. But also, too, I think specifically, 
I was going to say that I think also too, though, specifically for sleep, I think people are afraid of getting on any type of sleep aid. So it's not necessarily just cannabis. Like, you know, people don't want to take, you know, whatever it is people are prescribing these days, Zopiclone, Trazodone, you know, Seroquel, you know, whatever the top sleeping pills are. I know Seroquel is kind of an odd one to mention there, but I see that prescribed a lot for sleep these days. Um, you know, in terms of cannabis it, itself, like, do you feel that there's more of a um, of a barrier into introducing cannabis for sleep, say, than the other pharmaceuticals that I just mentioned, or do you feel like it's a roughly the same? Um, I think most people who come to me as a specialist have tried some of those other things, um, and they don't work, you know, or, or they feel snowed by the benzodiazepines or the Lunesta, or they, they woke up in their car on Ambien, you know, those are scary. And, and people talk about those experiences because they're so wacky. Um, so yeah, there definitely are people who come having tried nothing and are still kind of trying something. Maybe they heard there's a lot of people having success with cannabis and they don't want to try anything else. Um, but most of the time these days, I think people are coming having at least failed other treatments. Um, but I think the interesting thing about cannabis, and hopefully that's attractive, is it can be so personalized. You know, there are some people who have trouble getting to sleep, but they're fine once they are asleep. And vice versa, there are people who have trouble staying asleep, although they can, you know, be knocked out very quickly. So cannabis can fit those different types of people. There's some products that work quickly to get you asleep. And then there are also products that can help stay asleep. Um, you know, there's a new product that just came out this year. So there's a lot of research and new things coming on. And the product that came on this year, at least on the East Coast, is a spray. And the attractive thing for sleep is that it works quickly and then it's gone quickly. So someone who wakes up in the middle of the night can grab a spray. Okay, so, so when you say a spray though, so I've seen now, um, I've seen sprays that, you know, you basically just spray into your mouth, like say you would um, more or less spray like a mint spray into your mouth. But then I've also seen like nebulizers. So like something like Ventolin. So like a medical device, like an inhaler that people use for asthma. So you're talking specifically, I just want to be clear about that, but you're talking specifically about just the oral sprays that people right. can like just the old spray, spray into their mouth. Not the, right. Okay. Right. For about okay. 20 years Go ago, ahead. there are, there are, as you say, inhalers. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. Although those are an option. I, I haven't seen those regularly used for sleep. I think the attractive thing about a um, a traditional inhaler is that it looks normal. It doesn't look cannabis-like, so people feel more comfortable using it in public or somewhere that's outside of their house. Um, but these sprays, you know, the point is really just they have a, a niche market and it's new and interesting. Um, and cannabis as an industry is still in its infancy. There's a lot we're learning. There's a lot of products that are working, a lot of products that are out there that haven't worked. Um, there's a lot of hit and miss, um, just like there is in medicine. Um, but it seems strange and foreign when it's, when it's cannabis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, just coming back to, I guess, like, you know, how someone would approach cannabis to, to sleep. So my sort of approach is I like using about a four to one ratio, you know, initially at first, um, you know, sometimes you can go a little bit lower, but I find that if someone starts off, like if they, you know, have tried CBD, for example, for sleep, and some people do, um, especially if the, if the situation is, you know, kind of mild, they can sometimes just use CBD only and they can get to sleep. I think that might be about maybe about 15% of my patients, but not, you know, too, too many. So most people do require a little bit of, of THC, like more than four out of five. Um, but I think introducing just about two and a half milligrams at a time. So say if you tried, you know, 10 or 20 milligrams of CBD and that didn't work for you, um, you know, try two and a half milligrams of, of THC, see if that works. You know, if that doesn't work and another night you can try another two and a half milligrams where you're up to five. And if that doesn't work and go up to seven and a half, like I tell people to basically keep going until they get to a one-to-one. -one. And if they get to a one-to-one, -one, then I want them to, you know, chat with me again, because I don't really like people using, you know, too much more of a one-to-one -one ratio if they don't have to. Um, but, you know, that's kind of always been my approach is to use CBD first. Then if CBD doesn't work, uh, slowly introduce THC at about two and a half milligrams a night. Um, and then there's also, you know, people talking about CBN, uh, which is another cannabinoid, which, 
you know, some people have found to be helpful for sleep. There's really not that much research on it. I actually did find um, the first study of its kind. It was really terribly done, though. Maybe about two weeks ago, they had like CBD versus CBN for sleep. And actually, CBN did win in that study. But like I said, it was, you know, very, very uh, poorly designed and poorly done. So I'm not putting you know, too much onus on that. Um, anything else with, that you wanted to chat about with regards to your book and sleep before we, we move on? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this, the, we, we could have hour long conversations on each of these topics. You know, I think the reason the reason CBD works, the reason THC, these cannabinoids work is, you know, you have in your brain a cell called the microglial cell, um, which governs the circadian rhythm. And when you have regular sleep, you know, if you're waking up at the same time, you're going to sleep at the same time, your body gets into a cycle. Um, and that cycle you can hack. Um, and cannabis is one way you can do that. You know, some people use what are called binaural apps. These are apps that have sound in a certain frequency. And we've learned over time that frequencies touch those microglial cells. Um, and this is, of course, in the book too. But cannabis happens to touch those same microglial cells and helps people kickstart a sleep rhythm. Um, but cannabis will work if you're also considering the environment. If you're trying to use cannabis as a knock you over the head, fall asleep whenever you want to, it tends to not work. Um, but it does work when you combine the chemistry of cannabis with the environment of going to sleep at a certain time and waking up at a similar time. Um, so it's important to know the full picture, both what you're doing you know, in your body, but also why your environment, the set and setting is really important too. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because sleep hygiene is incredibly, incredibly important. You just cannot get away from it, no matter what medicine you take, no matter how much you know, cannabis you use, no matter what ratio you use, you need to really, really pay attention to sleep hygiene. Um, and for me, one of the big things is light. So like when I get up in the morning, I have these Luminette 3 glasses that I wear or I go outside and get a bunch of sunlight in my face. Um, you know, I think that's really good for you know, resetting your circadian rhythm, making sure your body knows you're awake at a certain time. Um, and then also too at night, like I'll wear uh, blue blocker glasses before light, before bed. And then, you know, making sure that you're doing all the right things with regards to sleep hygiene, you know, not drinking too much water before bed, not eating too close before bed. Um, you know, not having caffeine later in the day, um, you know, all these things I think are, are really important. So I think that was a fantastic point that you just, um, that you just mentioned in there, but yeah, I guess we've kind of honed in on sleep, um, enough. So maybe we'll kind of move on to, to the last kind of big topic, I guess, which would be anxiety and, and stress. Um, so this is probably, um, you know, maybe not the most common one, but certainly in the top three, like you mentioned, reasons for why people do want to start using cannabis. Um, so when you uh, see patients who are new, who, you know, have a little bit of stress, have a little bit of anxiety, maybe they're on an SSRI, maybe they, they, they aren't, um, what's your sort of approach to using cannabis to help alleviate their symptoms? Um. It's a good question. I think, you know, again, everybody's new coming to cannabis. So the, the three decisions I encourage people to make, you know, which I outline in the book are what is your timing? You know, do you want something that's going to help you feel better instantly? Do you want a cushion through the whole day? So if you're living a stressful work life, you know, you want that to be a little bit better. Or is it something you prefer more at the end of the day? So help you unwind and separate work day from home day. Um, timing is an important step one. Step two is, you know, learning whether people are comfortable feeling different. You know, a lot of people are used to their stress. They're used to feeling grumpy. Um, they don't realize that that reflects their endocannabinoid tone, that all of us have a certain tone um, that we're born with. And, you know, some people are comfortable augmenting that or changing that, you know, with, with different levels of, of comfort. So someone who's comfortable feeling altered is a different person, different products than someone who's not. That's really decision two. And then decision three is when in the day are they going to take it? You know, there are products that reflect some increase in energy. There are products that tend to calm people down. And, and once people have those three decisions done, and there's, there are a couple more that I, I sort of have nuanced to, but that's the big picture. Once they have that mindset, which is thinking about what their needs are, then they can go to a store and talk to people who are not medically educated. They're not able to diagnose a customer. They're able to match products to what your needs are. 
But if you go into a dispensary and you haven't thought about what you need, you might be overwhelmed. You might take what they find worked for someone else and it's not really about you. Um, so there's a part of this process, which is, you know, thinking about yourself, becoming your own expert, but also, you know, like, you know, we are here as providers to help people understand what their needs might be and what products might help them. Um, so like any medical specialty, you're probably not going to fix your own broken bones. You're probably not going to solve your own infectious disease. You know, we are, you and I studying this with the current, uh, the current, current literature and, and what patients have found successful in the past. And we're applying that to new patients. So there's a piece of, of expertise that's relevant too. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that you do need to decide. It's sort of like this approach to nutrition too. You know, before you, you know, make nutrition plans, you need to understand like, when are you going to eat? Like, when is it viable for you to eat? You know, like the, these types of things, these decisions have to be, you know, made like, are you going to eat most of your calories in one meal? Are you going to eat your calories throughout the day? You know, like what foods, you know, uh, cause you to have low energy, high energy, like all these things kind of need to be, you know, teased out and thought about before you actually make a plan. Um, so, you know, if someone is saying, I think the typical person who comes in for new for cannabis anyway, um, is someone who comes in and has never used it at all. So no THC, no CBD, you know, maybe they're taking an SSRI, maybe they're not. Um, and for someone like that, like usually my, my approach is just to start off with CBD only. Like I always just try to see if CBD only works. Like I said, not against THC in any way, but this is just my approach. Let's see if CBD only works. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, 10 to 20 milligrams, two to three times a day, sometimes four times a day is a pretty effective dose. Um, and then again, if that's not working out, then I would do the same thing for sleep, add in the two and a half milligrams of THC and see if that makes a difference without you feeling impaired. And, you know, if it's, if you're one of these people like Dr. Kaplan just mentioned that really doesn't want to feel like they're out of their body in any kind of way, just take two and a half milligrams with the CBD on the weekend and see how you feel. And for most people, like I said, they have no type of high whatsoever when they have a ratio four to one of CBD to THC that I can say that for the majority of my patients. Um, and I can say that with, you know, a lot of confidence, but also to, you know, be careful with it. I'm not saying that you are definitely going to, but for the most part, that's what I've seen is that when you use a ratio of about four to one of CBD to THC, people seem to, you know, not get high. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I, I, I wanted to ask you about this maybe more at the end, but we're kind of approaching to the end. So we'll maybe just tie it in here now. So there's other cannabinoids besides CBD and THC. You know, one of them I mentioned earlier was CBN. Again, minimal research, lots of anecdotal, you know, reports saying that it can be effective for sleep. But one cannabinoid that um, has become a little bit more popular, it is commercially available in Canada, um, is CBG. And so CBG um, has some properties that are um, similar to CBD, but also distinct. So I've seen some uh, studies anyway that have shown that CBG can have uh, an anti-anxiety effect as well um, as, as CBD does, but it does it in a distinct mechanism. So um, when you are, you know, talking about anxiety to your patients, Dr. Kaplan, are you mostly talking about CBD first and then going to THC or CBG or how's your, what's your overall approach? So I don't want to be the master of my patients. I want them to be the master of their own fate. So my approach is always sharing knowledge. And that's really what I tried to do with the book is give people the keys. You know, I have in the first chapter, I have an outline, a huge chart of all the cannabinoids, all the terpenes, all the flavonoids. And these are compounds that are in cannabis and they all have action. Um, and if you don't know about them, when you're shopping for a product, if you're just looking at THC or CBD, you're missing almost the whole thing. Um, so CBG has qualities that are attractive and interesting for certain people. Um, and just like any medicine, if you don't know, if you don't read the fine print, you know, you might find yourself, you know, with circumstances that you didn't expect or didn't want. Um, so my approach to patients is to share knowledge. Um, and I try to do that without overwhelming people because there's a lot there to learn. Um, but when someone comes with anxiety, you know, they really should first think about 
what's causing their anxiety is that's still there. You know, if we try to treat someone's anxiety and they're going to that same job and they're ha having their boss yell at them the same way, you know, that's sort of hitting your head against the wall. Like, so I think, you know, as we were talking about before, it has to be a whole picture. You know, cannabis isn't a cure-all. It's a medicine which works in a system that has to change too, if someone wants sustained results. So, you know, you and I as family doctors have a full view of a patient. It's not just about this is a problem, we're going to fix a pill with an ill. Sorry, we're going to fix an ill with a pill. Um, it's about a whole person and what are they suffering with and what can help them learn about their own suffering, learn about the medicine that might be helping and make a good match that's longer lasting. You know, I think none of us wants temporary fixes. These are serious problems that people are dealing with and there should be appropriately serious solutions. Um, so my book, The Doctor Approved Cannabis Handbook, is aimed at sharing all of that knowledge. I really don't hold anything back. It's all there. It's all written for everybody to understand. It's not just for doctors and scientists. There's an index in the back that supports every single claim in the book. It's not trust me. It's look at the literature. I'm drawing from the literature. I'm reading for you and translating what this stuff really is. Excellent. And with regards to other cannabinoids, like I said, we talked a little bit about CBN, a little bit now about CBG. Um, one of the ones I always bring up to people, but I just never hear too much of it is THCV. And the reason why I bring this one up is because, you know, there was one study I mean, that showed that it could actually help diabetics, may even help uh, reduction in appetite and with weight loss. And so, you know, obviously Ozempic is kind of blown up. We know that anything that can, you know, help reduce uh, weight and can help manage appetite, you know, be welcomed by so many people. So can you tell us anything about THCV and is this, going to be commercially available sometime soon? Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, THCV is very exciting. You know, people don't know that on our pancreas, where we produce insulin, you have channels that are sensitive to outside input. Um, they're called TRPV channels. Um, THCV is a compound found in cannabis, usually really ancient cannabis, because it's been bred out because people were more looking for the high than the other stuff in cannabis. But it's coming back now. And there are products actually in Massachusetts, at least there were companies out in California um, that didn't survive, but their whole mission was to produce THCV. Um, and this THCV molecule touches those TRPV channels on the pancreas and actually stimulates insulin production, increased insulin. Um, and it also helps cells process glucose, process sugar a little bit better. So we've seen in my lab, um, I've done studies on this in, in, in small numbers, but we see people who have been on insulin getting off of their insulin because the THCV is doing the work for them. So this is not a mystery. It's not a pie in the sky. It's not a dream. It's a reality. Um, but the medical cannabis industry is really about making money at this point. It's not so much a serious medical specialty. Um, so I think, you know, we're starting to see pockets of companies that want to treat people and really take it seriously. But the vast majority of the industry is still looking to make the money back that they put in to set up shop. Um, so I think for now, some of these products are hard to find. Um, and that becomes frustrating when people learn about it. They understand how valuable this plant can be if you know what you're doing. But then they're set up with an industry that doesn't work for them in terms of what they can shop for. Um, so it's it's an interesting problem. Yeah, it's it's a little frustrating. Sometimes I don't talk about THCV too much because it's not commercially available. You know, because I'm sure there's people that are you know listening to this now, like, oh, you know, where can I get it? Where can I get my hands on it? You know, it sounds amazing, um, but. You know, it's uh, it's unfortunately not too you know commercially available right now. So I really hope that changes um, in the future. And and worse than that, I agree with you completely. Worse than that, um, there are companies out there that are producing THCV from Delta Eight, so producing it from the male plant from CBD, not the female plant THC. And actually, the THCV, even though it has the same exact name, doesn't work the same way. Um, so it's very confusing. The producers, you know, are not necessarily, I think, maliciously trying to trick people. They just don't understand the science well. And it does have a big impact. I've studied this in my patient populations. And the Delta-8 THCV does not do the same things um, as, as Delta-9 THCV. So it's a confusing, you know, very science-rich topic. Um, and people need to learn from experts to understand what's going to work and what isn't. Or else they're just going to be frustrated. Yeah. I mean... Um... You know, it sounds like there's a lot to unpack there with the THCV. I mean, to be honest, I'm not even wasn't even aware that there was a difference in Delta eight, Delta nine THCV. So, um, you know, I'm learning from you today too. So, I certainly appreciate that. Um, I'll have to know, send you a copy of the book. A few minutes left. 
Yeah, I would love to. I would love to read it, and uh, you know, I'm sure I would learn a lot from it. Um, and one of the things that I would probably learn from it, that we're going to ask you about now, is so you know, we've talked about these other cannabinoids. Is there anyone that I'm missing that you would really like to talk about, like a new cannabinoid that you feel may, um, you know, may maybe a, a breakthrough in medicine, or it can provide people with a lot of relief to a particular symptom? So there's a strange one, which is actually normally considered a terpene, uh, which is beta caryophyllin. Um, this is a compound that we know of from cracked pepper and from other normal natural, you know, nutritional food sources. But beta caryophyllin actually does work as a cannabinoid. It hits our cannabis receptors, the endocannabinoid system, uh, where the endocannabinoid gets its name from cannabis. But beta caryophyllin hits those same receptors um, in different ways than THC and CBD. Um, but it does work to help calm people down. Um, so other people who are interested in relaxation or some pain relief, um, but don't want to engage with THC or they're concerned about T uh, concerned about CBD, there are some other options. Um, and these terpenes, as they're called, are available organically and are, and are available by mail order all throughout the country. Um, you know, the federal government doesn't understand. So that. you can just get beta caryophyllin like on its own. Yes, you can. Sure. A couple of stores um, selling terpenes okay. directly to consumers. There's a there's a problem with that, unfortunately, although it's great to have access. If these are not diluted, they can be really caustic. They can be harsh and, and sometimes even hurt and, and, and cause trouble. Um, so it's important, again, to know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, beta carry often you can buy. You can buy humulene. You can buy uh, neurolidine. You can buy all of the major terpenes, uh, which, again, are listed in the book and what they do and where you can get them. Um, but yeah, no, it's not all a safe picture. You know, people should have guidance with what they're doing. This is not, you know, willy nilly medicine that anybody can can just grab and go. Understood. Um, well, you know, I certainly like the fact that you're kind of putting in all this effort to making cannabis a legitimate medicine. This is what we need it from the start. We need, you know, this to be taken seriously, just like, you know, pharmaceuticals are taken seriously. We need studies and we need, you know, people uh, educating others, which is exactly what you are doing. So. Um, before I let you go there, Dr. Kaplan, there's only a couple minutes left. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about your book, where we can see it, where people can follow you online, and maybe your, your handles for social media? Of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Doctor Approved Cannabis Handbook is available wherever books are sold. Um, I created a whole web page for the book called Kaplan Cannabis, C-A-P-L-A-N Cannabis.com. And there are hundreds of pages of free information there, um, how cannabis compares to over-the-counter medicines, how cannabis compares to pharmaceutical medicines for all the topics we covered here tonight. And everything is free. Um, me on socials, I'm trying to teach, as, as you highlighted. Um, I'm on Twitter, at D-R-C-A-P-L-E-N, at Dr. Kaplan. On Instagram, it's at Dr. Benjamin Kaplan. So D-R, Benjamin, and then Kaplan, C-A-P-L-E-N. Um, but if anybody reaches out to me, um, I'm happy to direct you. I'm happy to guide people. I see people across the country, um, both personally and just to help them with simple questions. Um, I'm really trying to get the word out. I think this has been a mission from the ground up. You know, cannabis wouldn't be here against every law, you know, opposing it if it weren't for real people who are curious and trying to stand up for what they think is right. Uh, I'm trying to just arm them, like you said, with knowledge. You know, knowledge in our culture is power. Um, and most of the knowledge I give is free all over social. So please have at it. Um, and I think, you know, if you're interested in the book, great. You know, my, my gain is not financial. Um, I really do hope to change the culture for the better. Um, and the book again is Dr. Approved Cannabis Handbook. Amazing. Well, I'm definitely going to be, uh, looking forward to getting my copy of your book, Dr. Kaplan. And thank you so much for sharing all our knowledge today and for coming on the show and for educating people about cannabis. We certainly appreciate it. Um, and as always, thank you to all the listeners uh, who listened to this episode. Um, you know, I enjoyed Dr. Cap, and I'm definitely going to have him back on again sometime if he will come back on. And appreciate everyone. And I'll see you guys again soon. Thanks so much.